Thank you. So there I was. There I was in a plane with two other people flying above the floodplain of the Mississippi Valley. Not 30,000 feet up, which is where most people probably in Boston Common would have, have seen the Mississippi Valley. A couple thousand feet up. We could see the patterns on the cows. We were zooming down the Mississippi Valley along the course of the river. I'd asked my friend to fly me there. He was, in addition to being a Chekhov scholar, a licensed pilot, I was just starting a book project, a project on massive earthquakes that had hit that region 200 years before in the winter of 1811 and 1812. I'm from around there, but I didn't really know that area. And I said, you know, one day in the hallway, I said, you know, I'd really like to get to know the lie of the land, see this area, right, where these earthquakes had hit. And he said, well, you know, I bet we could do something about that, right? So the three of us, a 19th century US, US historian, a Chekhov scholar, and a Japanese medievalist. <laughs> Sounds like we were going to walk into a bar, but in fact, we were in an airplane, right? <laughs> then we were, one of us was pregnant. We had, you know, had non-alcoholic beverages. They were also very nice. That trip remains the single best use of research money in my entire academic career. But I didn't know that at this time, because there we were, up above the Mississippi Valley, looking and looking. I'd read about these earthquakes. I'd read reports of people who'd felt them. And I knew that there were environmental signs that I had read in paper, because that's what I do. I'm a historian. I read pieces of paper. I'd read that there were signs on the earth, that the seismic waves had so disturbed the, the high this area of high water table and loose, unconsolidated soil that, in fact, it had thrust up um, this slurry of hot organic matter up out of the earth and made these so-called sand boils or sand volcanoes that you could still see. I wanted to get a sense of that before I started writing this history. And there we were. <laughs> it was a hazy day. There was a thunderstorm building. And my friend, the Chekhov scholar, who was a very responsible pilot, I could tell he was looking nervously at the clouds. We weren't going to stay up that much longer. Down the valley we flew, and I couldn't see anything. We were looking and looking. And I was feeling really guilty, like I hadn't done my homework. And I was leading these, my friends on a, I, like a sort of lost goose chase. And then all of a sudden, in a kind of mo spontaneous moment of realization, we all three realized in that plane, looking out the windows, that the evidence we were looking for was everywhere. All beneath us in this quiet soybean and cotton country where the Mississippi makes these sinuous curves in the central artery of North America were white splotches on the ground, everywhere. There were so many of them, they were so widespread that we could not see them because we were looking for a few things. Right? The earthquake evidence was so widespread and so visible, so obviously there, that we were overlooking it. And that moment changed the book I was going to write. Because I'm a 19th century historian. I deal with past people. Not to put too fine a point on it, I deal with dead people. <laughs> but this history was right there with me. This history was telling me that there were things that I, as a historian, and honestly as a child of that region, that I couldn't see because it was everywhere around me. I had grown up where these earthquakes of the Mississippi Valley were not history, they were punchline, right? a joke. So I had to write a history that was about what happened in the past, that was about 200 years ago, but that also was about how we can see or not see in the present day. So I wrote a book and finished it at UMass Boston, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary right now as a glorious public research institution in this fabulous city. I wrote a book that dealt with what happened in 1811, 1812, when these earthquakes, a series of them, and their magnitudes get really debated by earth sciences, like the environmental studies folks you'll see in the booths around here. Right? But they're estimated now to be around 7.2. I mean, these are serious quakes right? with serious effects. I wrote the book I was going to write in the first half about the effect of the quakes at the time, about how they sparked religious revival, about how they made native communities along the Mississippi River move and move right before Americans looking for land started flooding in 
So there is a whole American Indian history of the Middle Mississippi that we don't know because we, most people who are reading written records, only look at the part portion that is post-earthquake, that is after 1812, right? So these earthquakes that literally changed the topography that made smooth running rivers get all murky and messy and swampy and be what had been fertile hunting and farming and fishing ground became unpassable swamp, the great swamp. Any of y'all know Jimmy Driftwood, fabulous history teacher? And folk singer wrote a song about the Arkansas stud, uh, Tennessee stud, right? As a verse that goes, I never would have made it through the Arkansas mud if I hadn't been riding on my Tennessee stud. He knew his history. That song set in 1821, 10 years after those earthquakes. But that Arkansas mud that everybody had taken to be just the great swamp that had always been there was recent. People had been there left. Other people who were nearby who felt the shakes prayed to their God and saw those quakes as a reason to get, white, get right with the spirit world, right? Whether they were black and white Christians, or whether they were American Indians, Cherokees, Creeks, um, Osages, Chickasaws, the, the earthquakes were part of movements of religious revival. They were part of the Native American Confederacy fired up by Tecumseh and his brother Tenskwatawa. They were part of the Indian movement against Americans that's part of the War of 1812. These quakes were part of science. They were part of how early Americans were debating what is about the world? What is the evidence there? What do we know about the, what's under our feet? What causes these great heavings of the earth? They mattered. So how come we forgot them? And that's a middle third of my book, is how can we forget things that are that big and that meaningful to so many people for so long? And it turns out that when the environments change, so do people. So, the environments changed because Americans uh, went in and put in railroads and we cut down trees. Right? We drained swamps, one of the most massive engineering efforts of the 19th century, which is really quite saying something, was the effort to drain the Little River Drainage District, to create that. Massive drainage systems equivalent to the amount of earth moved in the Panama Canal. In fact, some of the same people and equipment went from the Panama Canal to the Little River Drainage District. People also forget things because of changes in society. So the Civil War brought conflict right to the epicenters, literally the epicentral region of these quakes, in what some people, if you're kind of Civil War geeks out there, you may know as the Battle of Island Number 10, in which a bunch of Union soldiers used these new ironclad steamboats, contrabands, people who'd recently freed themselves from slavery, wanted to help the Union win their freedom, dug a canal down and dropped down behind Confederate batteries on this island and, and seized control of this crucial choke point of the Mississippi River. All of that gets told in our, civil, our history of the U.S. Civil War. What doesn't get told is that the reason that the Confederates were camped out there, the reason it was such a good and defensible place was because there was a natural moat all around the back of Island Number 10 and that that was created by earthquakes. Those soldiers were fighting over seismic terrain, but that doesn't get recognized in any of our histories then or now. Subsequently, what had been a region of polyglot people speaking lots of languages from many ethnicities, hunting, fishing, trading, engaging in active diplomacy, trade, became a monocrop world of black and white agriculture. And it became one of the central points of our own homegrown domestic terrorism as the Ku Klux Klan, that new birth organization of the 19th century, focused much of its violence against African Americans right there in what's now Northeast Arkansas and Southeast Missouri. When many Americans think of that region, they don't think earthquakes. They think of men with sheets and guns. During the Great Depression, to overcome that history of racial violence, a number of sharecroppers got together in one of the, the early civil rights movement's first multiracial movements, the Southern Tenant, Tenant, Southern Tenant Sharecroppers Union, and got together, black and white people together, to protest agricultural policies that were meant to end the Depression, but that in fact were, had the unintended effect of throwing sharecroppers off their land because the people who got paid subsidies were the landowners, not the croppers. And these folks got together, they were very savvy, they called up all the photographers in St. Louis, Kansas City, Chicago, had them come on in, and they went to the side of the roadstead, because you can't be thrown off public land for three days. Camped out, men, women, children, old people, made their quilts, made their cooking fires on the side of a public road in the middle of the cold, cold winter of the late 1930s. When I tell people what I do, the area of the country I study, Right? That's what a lot of people know, is photographs of that protest. 
So there are changes to the environment itself. There were changes to society, and there are also changes to science. Because these quakes took place in 1811 and 1812, where the way people did science was to write about what they felt, what they heard, what they saw, what they thought, what, they, what their bodies did. If you were nauseous because of a quake, that was good, solid scientific evidence about its power, and you would put that in your report. By the early 20th century, if you were a geologist and you felt nauseous because of a quake, that wasn't something you put in your reports. Because what you were reporting was part of the great revolution of instrumentation in the earth sciences. Starting in the 1880s and continuing till about the 1920s, a revolution took place in which instrumental knowledge, the hard and fast quantified information of seismic equipment and seismographs became the way to know earthquakes. So by the early 20th century, reading newspaper accounts with lots of wild stories and exclamation points, that wasn't a way to do science. The way to study earth science was to look at hard and fast numbers and instrumental data. And where do we have instrumental data about? Well, the earthquake zones we know about. The ones on the, east, on the west coast, sorry. The ones along the Ring of Fire in Japan, along Alaska. Not the middle of the country. We all know what the dangers are there, right? You get carried away by tornadoes. Everybody knows that. That's not earthquake terrain. So something that was big and that mattered in all kinds of ways in people's lives can get lost because of changes in the way we do our science, because of changes that make other aspects of the sciences so clear, because of changes to the environment itself that hides these earthquake traces. Even the plowing of successful agriculture in this fertile heartland destroys these former sand blows. Right? And changes to the very people there, that the folks whose stories and oral histories would have told us about the earthquakes voted with their feet and left. So why do these matter now? Well, they matter because so-called intraplate quakes, that is earthquakes that happen not at the boundary of a tectonic plate, right, the, the, most of the ones we're familiar with, but in the middle of one. Those are characteristic of places like the Australian desert and of northwest China, where some of the biggest quakes in terms of human catastrophe have ever taken place have been intraplate quakes. They matter because really interesting um, multidisciplinary scientists doing what they call paleoseismology have found out that the, uh, the, 19, sorry, the 1811, 1812 quakes are only the most recent series of earthquakes to have hit that terrain. That digging down into that floodplain, they see evidence of sand blows from many hundreds and indeed thousands of years ago. And it looks pretty darn sure that these kind of earthquakes, sequences of them, months apart, hit the Mississippi Valley with, reg with geologic regularity about every two to 800 years, it looks like. And did I mention these were 200 years ago? They matter because we know that unreinforced masonry is the one place you do not want to be standing when your soft soil shakes by an earthquake and that even moderate-sized earthquakes can wreak havoc. I thought about this as I was standing next to um, a, a, an earthquake engineer giving a presentation to a bunch of middle school scientists right in the Boot Heel region of Missouri that is a, the, at the epicenter of these quakes. We were standing there as every middle schooler in the Tri-County area filed in to hear about earthquake engineering and earthquake history. And I looked around at this full auditorium full of an entire region's middle schoolers in this concrete one-story block building. And I said to this engineer, now, when you folks talk about unreinforced masonry, now, is it, that, that, that's what you're talking about, right? And he looked at me and said, well, I'm, I'm sure they've probably done some seismic retrofitting. Right? It matters because these quakes may come back. It matters because these quakes can tell us, the history of these quakes can tell us about the potential of earthquakes in other parts of the world. And it matters, I think, because these quakes tell us not only about what we know and how we know, but how we can deny and how we can forget. Right? When we define a hot summer as a freak, as a statistical aberration, as not telling us something about our present day climate, right? are we doing the same thing as when we look at the past and say, no, uh-uh, can't be any earthquakes there, that's the boring middle of the country. And that's why, I think we need to know about the lost history of the New Madrid earthquakes. Yeah. All right, thank you. <laughs> now I get it anyway. <laughs> Questions? Questions uh, for, for, for Professor Valencis? 
who had heard about the new Madrid earthquakes before this talk? Okay. So Where? Four, four. Where had you heard about them? From you. <laughs> Excellent. Do we have a question in the back? Yes, all the way. Ah. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. There are a sequence of them that occurred over the winter. So the first shocks took, are there three, maybe four, depending on who's counting them or how they're counting them. And they took place uh, between early or mid-December and early February of 1811-1812. So we often talk about them as the, and they get written about actually as the New Madrid earthquake because that's the pattern. And that's how we talk about earthquakes is, you know, there's a lead up of four shocks, there's a main shock, and there's an aftershocks. And that kind of pyramid makes it real, under, you know, we understand that, right? But that's, that does not characterize this pattern of seismicity. And one of the really interesting and also quite daunting aspects of these quakes is that they recur in sequence, right? So twice in a couple years interval, I've had the privilege of sitting at public briefings from seismic engineers who were talking about their plans for rebuilding um, uh, uh, overpasses and so on after the quake and how fast within a couple months they could get them rebuilt. And each time I've raised a hand to say, um, what if the next shock hits right when you get that built? Right? And they say, we, we don't know how to plan for that. Our planning hasn't caught up. Professor Nelson. So, Connor Larry, I think it's your fault. I was reading up on your research and I got shingles. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so my terrain is uh, quite Disrupted. Quite Disrupted. Connor Larry, I wanted to ask you a question. It's a little off script, but uh, why are you at UMass Boston? And, oh. and, our, and is your passion atypical of professors at the university? Do you know, I walked in my very first day of teaching at UMass Boston, kind of nervous with all my sharp pencils, right? And I got off the shuttle bus and I walked in. It was this real, and it was an un, unusually really cold, kind of yucky September day. And I walked in and that beautiful white building, right, with the, the big glass that looks out over Boston Harbor. And there was Chancellor Motley, who wasn't wearing his bright blue robe, but was equally impressive, with this phalanx of staff, with these big balloons. And Chancellor Motley was booming out, welcome, welcome to your first day at UMass Boston. And I knew it wasn't exactly for me, but it could well as well have been. So I think that my passion is very typical of many of those at UMass Boston. I will say that on my CV, as you read, I am a proud graduate of Little Rock Central High, a historic place in its own right. Go Tigers, Go Tigers that's right. Uh, um, and that the mission of UMass to recognize all that is driving and all that is exciting and all that is inspiring right, in the Bostonians and the Massachusetts residents and in all those who wish to come to us from a lot of different countries. I find that truly inspiring each and every day. It sounds cornball, but it's true. <laughs>